good morning dears today i would uh, i'll talk something about um, the visual laws without any reason normally we don't find any reason but definitely we will have some reason but when you examine the person just by seeing the fundus these type of examinations may not give us a clue may not give us a clue regarding the visual loss that we take it as unexplained visual loss my topic is on unexplained visual loss what do you mean by unexplained visual loss the visual loss that cannot be explained with obvious abnormalities of the eyes suppose i am having keratoconus i know problem is because of keratoconus i know he is having a problem of optic nerve problem i know he is optic now the reason is reason for visual loss is optic now macula uh, macula of, of the retina a problem is there then i will tell you definitely he is having a problem in the macula that's the reason for your visual loss like that but if you don't find any clue any problem like this you take it as unexplained but you have to approach systematically systematically you have to approach the patient then you can find out some reason for the problem i will tell you how to approach normally you know we will come across these type of patients is very difficult to find out the reason for the visual loss in the patient but remember now one thing always there will be a hidden cause for visual loss and it has to be found out how to find out a careful history you have to take classical history from the patient then detailed clinical examinations if needed few relevant investigations may help us to clean the diagnosis in most of these conditions my one advice if you are not able to find out any reason never label a person as a malingerer or is having some functional problems like hysterical don't make it immediately again and again examine again examine again many times you have to examine then only you can come to a conclusion my sincere advice if you are not able to find out any reason for the patient's visual loss never label a person a malingerer the most important statement you are supposed to know now when you exam when you start you know listen to the complaints he will give some clues definitely he will give, give us some clues for this i'll tell you he is telling now visual loss what you are doing in deal is what unexplained visual loss he is telling something about the visual loss you ask a leading question now you ask a leading is it visual loss is what visual loss is a transient one is coming and going or is it an acute sudden onset problems or is a chronic problem this is like that you have to ask a leading question i tell you when you have a transient visual loss that is called transient obscuration of vision obscuration of vision transient loss of vision you have to ask a leading question now is it ask for the duration of the loss the transient loss is there duration of the loss how many uh, seconds or how many minutes the visual loss uh, is there is existing if, if you know suppose ask for the few seconds or something like that you must know this now i'll tell you if you have got transient visual loss lasting for few seconds think it can be a case of a raised intracranial pressure never forget that a transient loss of vision lasting for few seconds like 5 seconds 10 seconds and all first think about the problem may be somewhere in the brain in raised intracranial pressure you know why the transient loss occurs there the transient loss occurs in a, classically you know when you have papillary edema definitely you know it's a case of papillary edema is there that's all but papillary edema as per they may not produce visual loss initially one in end stage you can have visual loss because of developing optic atrophy that is different but when there is a raised intracranial pressure why there is a visual loss an exam question for you your answer is sir there is a raised intracranial pressure you can have spasm of the ophthalmic artery or spasm of the posterior cerebral artery can occur which can result in transient loss or you can have a problem which can increase the 
third ventricle size because of a block a tumor between the third ventricle and the aqueduct they can block it the third ventricle can transiently increase in size which can compress the chiasma once that obstruction is relieved the third ventricle comes back to normal size the vision is regained this is also one of the reasons this is called a tumor within third ventricle is called ependymoma it is also is called as a ball ball valve tumor it's called ball wall ball wall tumor ball wall tumor of the third ventricle ball wall ball wall which can transiently block the aqueduct the junction between the third ventricle and aqueduct increase the size of third ventricle which can compress the chiasma underneath and once the obstruction is relieved the patient regains his visual loss he again he regains his vision again that's what the most important point so when you have a transient loss of vision lasting for a few seconds never never forget about increased intracranial pressure one more thing never for again again i will tell you you have to as an ophthalmologist you must all also think about the possibility of the possibility of a primary angle closure glaucoma early defects early stages this is also one of the important points you are supposed to next point by important point what when you have a transient loss lasting for minutes i am not telling about seconds now lasting for minutes think is having a severe headache and all it it has to be a case of it has to be a case of what migraine migraine may be one of the reasons for a transient loss for lasting for few minutes migraine patient definitely will have what fortification specter is called tachycardia they can have they can experience scintillating photomas they will tell you sir i am seeing some zigzag lines or something like lightning and all so that's called scintillating photomas the patient may experience that the term given for that scintillating photomas all called as tachycardia is also exam question for you tachycardia means in migraine patients they can experience fortification spectra or scintillating scotomas now i already told you it may be one of the uh, earliest problems of angle kosha glaucomas the transient lost lasting for few seconds raised intracranial pressure transient loss lasting for minutes migraine and never forget it can be a case of a primary angle closure glaucoma early stages now i told you transient loss suppose it is because of acute problem acute visual loss is there sudden onset first diagnosis should be what irritable bronchitis you have to think about of course when you examine you can find out it doesn't matter but you have to, when you ask history acute think about you are dealing with the case of irritable bronchitis or patient may be having a pituitary tumor which have which have been compressing the chiasma and so now you are not able to see now but compressing has a sudden hemorrhage into the tumor the size of tumor increases and compressing chiasma further the problem is increased the visual problem that means what when you have an acute problem of visual loss think about retinal bronchitis optic neuritis or can be a case of a pituitary tumor already is there which can have hemorrhage inside one more thing is there a chronic hypertensive patients or renal patients can have uremia the nitrogen level urea level in the blood increases what happens now in these patients these uremia patients can have depression of ganglion cells they can depress the ganglion cells not only the retina in the occipital lobe also naturally they will have visual loss these are problems to be thought of when you have a case of an acute visual loss suppose He is having optic neuritis, man. Retinal neuritis patients. You ask him to take exercise. The visual loss is further getting deteriorated. That is called utap sign. You know why utap sign happens? What happens now when you do exercise? The temperature of the body is increased. You will have in the myelin sheath, the demelting areas. The axons are there. Axons are there. We can have a chemical changes are taking place. The environment, the chemical can environment is changed. and moreover the temperature increase itself can reduce the conduction the axons are getting problems that is the reason for your never forget reasons for your visual loss utap sign in a case of optic neuritis in a particular in a case of multiple sclerosis now the visual is visual loss is if it is chronic now you have to ask leading questions like intake of some drugs like isoniazid 
ethambutol, tamoxifen, tobacco. I'm an alcoholic. Also, always, always remember alcohol also can produce problems. You know one thing, classical exam question again. You know we have got methyl alcohol can produce hotel loss of vision. You know that. The chronic problem is what? Now ethyl alcohol. You know the ethyl alcohol, I'm, that's called partial loss of vision. It's called ambilopia. Ambilopia, ethyl alcohol poisoning is called as ambilopia patatorum. This is a standard exam question for myself. I will ask you this question only. What the name given for the ambulopia of uh, ethyl alcohol? Your answer should be ambulopia patatorum. Then they will, will ask you, why? Because those days, the alcohol, ethyl alcohol, used to be prepared from potatoes. That is why it was given a name called ambulopia patatorum. So, so far I have dealt you something about the visual loss. When you encounter a patient with visual loss, you have to ask the leading questions now. A transient, acute, or chronic, over. Next is what? Pain. What about the pain? Is having visual loss agreed? But the pain is there. Pain is there on movements of the eye. Your answer is, do you know something about Whitnall hypothesis? When you have a ritter bulb neuritis, when you have a ritter bulb behind the eyeball, the ritter bulb neuritis is there. When you ask the patient to look up or look adduction, that is adduction and elevation. When the patient looks up and adduct, he can experience pain. Now the question is what? Why doctor will ask you? Your answer is, sir, when you look up or adduct, what happens now? The middle rectus or the superior rectus, tendons at their origins have got connection to the dura mater around the optic nerve. Naturally, when they contract, they pull the inflamed nerve and they experience pain. This is called Pitnall hypothesis. This is called Pitnall hypothesis. Now, again, think pain. When you combing of the hands and all, when you have a, a scalp tenderness, the problem is what? They can have temporal arthritis. That is also one of the reasons for your transient loss of vision. Sorry, sudden loss of vision, whatever thing. You can have loss of vision. Unexplained means you had to ask a leading question of uh, tenderness in the temple area because you can experience some anti anti ischemic optoneuropathy, temporal arthritis, medium sized vessel problems. They can produce visual loss in the patient. Now, headache. Headache itself can give us a clue regarding the nature, location, and all. I will tell you, a throbbing pulse dial, throbbing headache, migraine. Suppose I'm having a headache in the bipartial area. Bipartial area is there, is having visual loss. Spinal sinusitis. You know one important point? The most common sinus that can involve or that can produce optic neuritis is spinal sinusitis. Never forget this. Because why? The spinal sinus is separated from optic neck canal area with thin bone. Not too much. That means what the most common si sinus which can involve your optic or which can produce optic neuritis is spinal sinus. Is that again the exam question for you in the classical for viva? Next, what? Sometimes you see patient has come, he's having no palsies and all, and he will have double vision. See, one eye will have a the affected eye image will be blurred. Or the other eye image will be clear. That fellow will think what now is a blurred image, that's false image that belongs to the abnormal eye, the paralyzed eye. Muscle eye will appear blurred. He will think it's a visual loss. So that means what? When you have experience, of, uh, uh, when you see a person of unexplained visual loss or something, visual loss is there, ask, uh, do we experience double vision? We have to ask a leading question or at least we have to investigate. How do you know how to investigate? Now you just close one eye. One eye close, the diplopia disappears. That means the neurological problems. When I close one eye, diplopia persists. That means it has to be an eye problem, that's all. That means what? When you have, when you close one eye, diplopia disappears. It's a neuro problem, that's all. That is called, we call it as binocular diplopia. Only when both eyes are open, he's having diplopia vision. When one eye is closed, no diplopia. It's called monocular diplopia. That like is. Now, we can ask the leading question again before going to examination. You see now, these are the various historical history history are supposed to elicit. Now, 
hallucinations. The patient will tell you, sir, I am seeing something, cattle, something, uh, yeah, fender, something like that. These are all formed objects. When the patient tells you he is having a, a formed objects, hallucinations, is the temporal oblations. Suppose the patient tells you, sir, I am seeing some zigzag lines and all, nothing. Else, no formed image. That's called unformed objects. Unformed objects. Never forget hallucinations. You have to think about occipital oblations. That means you have to investigate further. That means patient has come to you with some visual loss. You have to ask a leading question like this. Are you experiencing some hallucinations like that? You have to ask. From that only you can easily find out the problem is where. Now, any history of, you have to ask a past history. Any history of trauma. Even trivial injury, the fellow would have forgotten. They would have produced you know, damage which will not be seen clearly. So never forget now, history of injury, even a minimal trauma, they will make give problem to the optic nerve because of fracture somewhere area, in optic canal area. They can produce. That's the reason for this. You have to ask the leading question of history of injury to the patient. It may be trivial also. Now, once I have asked about the history, history and all, I will examine the patient now. See, initially I have not found out any reason. Never forget that. So I have there is no shortcut for again and again. When you want to examine again and again, you examine nothing wrong. When you're able to not, not you are not able to find out any reason, you examine him again and again. Patient has to, has to be examined. Now there is no shortcut. There is no shortcut. You have to do thorough examination. Don't it may be it may take time, doesn't matter. And I, I'll tell you. Immediately, suppose the patient has come, lost the vision. Don't ask for MRI immediately. You examine him properly. Then ask for leading, ask for something, a, a cost investigation and all later on. Okay. And one more I already told you. Don't never, never make a person malingerer or functional type. Just one examination or one history. Don't do that. You have to examine, keep on examining how many, whatever time you, you, are, you have to suppose to. You have to examine him again and again. Then finally you can come to a conclusion. You, have to, you can do test for malingering. That is different. Now, I am examining the person now. His visual acuity is reduced. Now I want to know what about the visual, what's the reason for the visual acuity loss? Very simple. The visual acuity loss may be bare man, maybe in the retina or optic nerve. That's all. Optic nerve, that's called, or is a neurological problems or a neurological problems. Or optical problems. That means optical means what, man? It's maybe refractive errors. Or something problem in the cornea. Some problem somewhere in the lens like this. Or is there a retina problem? Or is there a neuro no optic no problem? It's all neuroretinal pro retinal problems. Very simple test, which is available with all of us in our uh, trial set itself. The whatever the lenses are there, no the trial set. We can have that pinhole. This pinhole, if you put if the vision improves, if the vision improves, that means your retina is okay. That means what vision is improved means the problem is where? The problem should be where? Within the before the retina. I'll tell you here. One, refractive errors. Uncorrected refractive errors. Or I can have some tear film abnormalities. Tear film abnormalities on this cornea. Tear films are irregular. The problem may be there. So when pinhole improves, think about uncorrected, uncorrected refractive errors or tear film abnormalities or corneal irregularities. Maybe you can have uneven corneal this. Then lens, early stage of cataract, early stages of cataract. Or you're done cataract surgery again. You're done. But yes, develop some after cataracts like electronic pearls like that. So that means what? When you have a pinhole, if the vision improves, vision improves, it rules out your retina problems. It rules out your optina problem. Like that, you know that. So then problem is where somebody is in there. I only, I know that. Usually refractive errors, irregularity cornea, tear film abnormalities, lens, early development of developing cataract. Cataract is there, or you can have what? What else now? You are done cataract surgery. You might have developed an after cataract like electronic pearls. These are all the things you are supposed to know. The rule of or the use of pinhole is also a common question examinations. Now, once you have done that, 
examine the person in lids. Lids, you know, we have got um, uh, so many glands are there, mebomin glands, zeis glands, so many things are there. These glands functions are very important. The member mebomin glands, they're all tarsal plate the glands, the zeis glands, these are all sebaceous glands. They produce some sebum, and that means what they produce some oil like they can cover the tear fluid, which will prevent evaporation. So, when a problem is there in the lid margin, simply you know, collision is there. What is collision? You know, everyone knows it's a problem of mebomin glands where blepharitis is there, that means inflammation of the lid margins. So, naturally, what the tear fluid abnormality will be there because the tear fluid cannot remain there because the a lipid part or the fatty lipid layer of the tear fluid is lost. That means they can the tear fluid can easily get evaporated or it can spill out of the eye. That's where the dryness can take place. That's the reason for you have to see the lid margins. When you examine the pathogen again and again, you have to see the lid margins again. Next, how do you know clinically the lid? See that you're not examining, you are asking a leading question now. The tear fluid problem is there. Very simple. Whether your vision improves with blinking. Suppose I blink, the vision improves, I know the problem is tear fluid because the tear can spread. When you're blinking is a must, man. Blinking is a must for the spread of the tear fluids on the cornea. So naturally, when the blink improves, the vision, you know the problem is in somewhere in tear fluid only. Blinking improves on point, point now here. Now you examine the cornea. With a strict lamp, there are so many investigations. You know, instruments are there. You can examine the placido disc for astigmatism, keratoconus, so many things. That means what? You have to examine the cornea thoroughly, whichever instrument available with you. But never forget to do your slit lamp examinations. If you got a placido disc, agreed. Or never forget to see your endothelium. Your slit lamp itself, you can do that. A specular reflection. These are all the various things corneal examination must. Next is what? When you go inside people, whenever you see a people, in this case, you can see now the right eye people contracting and swinging the light to the left side, the left people dilating. That means what? The left eye has got related afferent pupillary defect. Optic nerve is damaged, maybe. But causes may be where? Related afferent pupillary defect, otherwise called Marcus again. Pupil can occur in many cases. Classical, maybe retinal lesions. Retinal lesions may be there. Or optic neuritis may be there, optic compression may be there, anything may be there. But here one point important uh, problem, you know, you will ask in exams. In this case, you got left up, relative upper defect is there. You tell me now, because the light triplex pathway goes up to the tract and comes out, then when it comes out, it can then when it can comes out. That means what? It up to tract, even up to midbrain, you can have a problem. That means what? How do you know? Which tract is involved? Never forget. In this case, where is the problem now? Where is that? Uh, which eye? Left eye. Your tract has to be opposite side. Left eye problem is there. Your answer has to be right optic tract is involved. Now they will ask you why? Why? Your answer is, sir, the pupil size and reactions are all maintained by your nasal retina. The nasal retina is excess. It completely crosses in chiasma and go to opposite side tract. That is why when tract is involved, the pupil problem will be seen in the opposite type. Never forget this point again. Okay, I told LD. Now I have seen how everybody is there. Think about what are the reasons why I told you already. There are so many reasons for that. But never forget, maybe one eye, one side of taking a problem. Even bilateral optic nerve problem is there, but asymmetric. They are not equally involved. One eye is more, more involved compared to other eye. It can have a related operant pupil defect. The more involved eye or optic tract, I told you. Optic tract. But optic tract, I already told you what? Never, never forget to know the optic tract involved is opposite. Now, once you have found out a related operant pupil defect is there, now I have to what now? A classical field charting, visual field charting. What for? To localize the lesion where it could be. I will tell you how. Now, when I have a nerve fiber defect, like, you know, you must be knowing something, glaucoma field defects, arcuate defect, central scrotum, all like that you got. Or it's a tubular vision. So many things are there. Never forget this. 
that means uh, arcuate defects nerve fiber defects there is no hemianopia that is loss of one half is not there is not homonymous same side defect is not there that is we got when there is no hemianopia it's only a central scotoma or a blind part and central scotoma combined is called centrocecal scotoma or you can have like this that means what the problem somewhere be before the chiasma or in the optic nerve or in the retina like this that means what once a founder or a pd do field charting find out is it only optic nerve retina problem or it is above above i'll tell you how about is not now you can see now here this is called arcuate defects that means arcuate defect is here that means what the problem somewhere in the retina or optic nerve only or you can see a central scotoma here central scotoma is here can you see now central scotoma that means what here problem see arcuate scotomas see the central scotoma is there see the blind spot is there central cecal scotomas see now central scotoma these are all what these are all the problems occurring before the chiasma anterior to the chiasma i can when i do rapd you do field chart you can find out the problems next is now when you have this type of problems you know usually we see now inflammations like that usually mass lesion may not be there when you have arcuate defects central scotoma these pictures usually i'm telling you only usually mass lesion may not be there when you have hemianopia means what now loss of one half loss of one half of field of vision right eye right half right eye left half like that similarly left eye right half like this your half and half is gone that means what you are dealing with a patient of and but to the hemianopia is there i'll tell you suppose this is the hemianopia this is hemianopia case see now this imagine is a right eye now right eye this half that means respecting the vertical meridian respecting the vertical meridian that means you are dealing with a case of neurokis you are dealing with a case of neurology case that means what when you have hemianopia respecting the vertical meridian because the, in the chiasma the fibers have crossed respecting the vertical meridian that means what the problem is in the neurological case see now optic nerve i know that means what when you have a problem like this arcuate defect or all these things have defects are not there when i have hemianopia field defects like this starting that means the problem somewhere maybe optic now junction to chiasma or chiasma itself or tract itself like that you must come to conclusion just by showing the field defects i can tell you where could be the problem for the patient but here need not be always inflammations it can be a mass lesions can you see now here this is called the central scotoma case the left eye central scotoma is here see now is even upper temporal that means what is something in the respect to the vertical meridian can you see this is a classical lesion now right side optic nerve junction to chiasma you must be aware you know hope hope you know about the something about the uh, arrangement of fibers just know this whichever i shows central scotoma suppose the other eye shows an upper temporal is got right eye temporal side nasal side upper temporal defects it has to be the junction of optic nerve to chiasma which side your answer is whichever eye shows central scotoma here is called left eye so natural left side optic nerve junctions and see now we have got right side half is gone right half is gone that means what right side homonymous both eye right side defects is respecting but in median it has to be something in the tract area just never forget this once you have found out rapd do field defects if you field defect give us a clue you can come to a conclusion it can be a case of optic nerve retina or like this or if you got a hemianopia or you can easily come to a conclusion you are dealing with a case of maybe chiasma or junction of optic nerve chiasma or optic tract suppose there is no history of classical hemianopia is not there or you are not able to find out now you see the ask is again i will told you acute visual loss that means what less than 2 weeks usually no mass when you have a chronic visual problem can be a mass lesion just by knowing the visual equity visual loss is there lasting few only within two weeks is an acute loss 
think about it cannot be mass. Very rare. Whereas the chronic problem, it has to be mass lesions. Now, so far I told you RAPD was there. We've approached. You know one thing? The pupillary light reflex pathway comes up to optic tract. It doesn't enter LGB, geniculate body also. It doesn't enter. It comes out of the tract. It enters your midbrain, dorsal portion. It enters your midbrain. Goes from there. That's why when you have a problem in that is the body, if you have got a problem in parietal lobe, occipital lobe, so many areas, you will not have pupil involvement. That means there is no RAPD. There is no RAPD. There is no relative different pupil defect. Now, what to what to, you have to think something about? Always remember, we are not able to find out any reason anteriorly. That means what can be ambulopia? What is ambulopia? Partial loss of vision. Partial loss of vision without any ophthalmoscopic findings. That is called ambulopia. That means I have to think it can be a case of ambulopia. Or when I examine the fundus with an ordinary ophthalmoscope, I am not able to find, I cannot see the microscopic level problems. That means what? Macular lesions that cannot be demonstrated. Suppose I am having a microscopic level changes are there. I cannot. Or RFD is not there. That means what? Both eyes optic nerve involved equally. One eye more involved. I told you RFD in the side. You can see. When both the optic nerves are involved, equal involvement, you cannot see the great effort and pupil defect. So these are the possibilities. That means what? One, you have to think about ambulopia. Number two, what? You have to think about the microscopic level change in the maculum, macular retina area. Or both sides, optic nerve involved equally. Suppose I'm having ambulopia. What could be the reason for ambulopia? Suppose I'm having one eye uh, minus four, other eye plus four. You have not corrected. Naturally, the anos is called anosometropia. Difference in power between two eyes is called anosometropia. Or I can have a macular problem beginning itself, or some developmental problem is there. So, due to profound sensory loss, the macula is not stimulated. That means vision is not improving. Or I can have a microtropia, small angle spint. These are all the reasons for your ambulopia. That means what? You are not able to find out the reason in the fundus. The possibilities are. That means again, I have to examine that's all. Anisometropia means what? Difference in power or refractive status between two eyes or profound, profound sensory deprivations. The light is not reaching your macula properly in the beginning itself. Or it can have a small angle spins. So naturally, when you have, suppose, ambulopia is there, so always remember, when you see red from pupillary defect was there, it cannot be ambulopia. Never forget this. Now I told you what? RAPD was not there. You think about ambulopia. When you have RAPD, definitely ambulopia should not be there. That's all. Macular problems, I'll do the microscopic level problems, which you cannot. Very difficult to find out clinically. That means clinically much examination time. But you can have some history. The fellow, fellow may tell you, sir, this object appears smaller for me. This object is larger for me. Or this uh, a straight line appears baby for me. This is all called micropsia. Metamopopsia or macropsia. These are all macular problems. History. You know the reason for micropsia? Micropsia means separation of cones. Macropsia means crowding of cones. Imagine one example. A person has to fall on 1,000 cones. Then only can have a proper image size of the person. Now the cones are getting separated. That fellow falls on only 100 cones. Naturally, size will be small. Suppose the person has to fall on 1,000 cones. Now, I got a crowding of cones. 10,000 cones are there. The person is falling on 10,000 cones. He will have a large size. It's macropsia. This word exam question again. Micropsia is because of separation of cones. Macropsia is because of crowding of cones. Metamopopsia is a baby. That means irregular surface. Now we have to examine what now again and again. I have to examine fund exam. There are other tests. Amsters, great and all. These are all the investigations to be done. And then I have to examine the macula with the higher magnifications. These photo stress recovery, Amsters, great task testing and all. You can find out the, the metamopsia. This Amsters, great. I can use it. 
I can find out metamorphia is there, microphia is there, macropsia is there. I can find out all these things. These are all Amsler grid, grid charts. This is called Amsler chart. See now micropsia small. See the macropsia. Can you see the large size? See now the breakfast table. See now the small size. See the metamorphia, the curved the pole is there. So it appears curved for me. It's called metamorphia. Metamorphopsia. Photosphere like means what? The time taken, suppose I dazzle a light. You know, suppose he is reading a uh, chart, Snellen chart. He is reading some line. Now I dazzle the eye with a light which can bleach your rods and cones and all. That means the bleaching takes place because mainly the rods. That means what photostress in the query means the bleaching is, you have put a light. Now you have to wait. Suppose he is reading only six, nine, six by nine let, line letter and I have put a light for 10, 20 seconds. Then I ask him to read again the time taken for recovery to one line above. Suppose 6, 9 means he has to read 6, 12. The time taken for this to read the 6, 12, 6, 9 letter he was initially reading. Now he's reading 6, 12. The time taken for it should be within 60 seconds. Within 60, this is a normal person. If it is prolonged, the problems are very in the macula, that's all. You understand now? Normally, should be able to read line in the 15 to 60 seconds. It takes much time, longer time means the macular problem is there. It's called photo stress recovery. It's called photo stress recovery test. You read, ask the patient to read the line, silent chart. He's reading some line. You dazzle the eye with a brilliant light for about 10 15 seconds with an ophthalmoscope. Now ask him to read again the silent chart. The time taken for its recovery to read the one line above. Normally, about 50 60 seconds. If it is prolonged, the macula is not getting recovered properly. I know the macula is a problem. Once you have ruled out the macula problem and ambulopia, of course, I already done the field charts. I have filled defects. I have already drawn the fields. I have conducted the field examinations. So far, I told you what? Hemianopia. Remember, now we have got hemianopia like this. You know, there are so many defects. See now, this also, I can have a field defects like this called sector. One sector is there, it's called right eye, left eye. Right, left side sector. Left eye also, left side sector. It's called left side sector nopia. It's an LGB problem. Genital verbal problem in the right side. See now, upper, I'm having upper temporal. Right eye also upper temporal. Upper temporal, humanima, same side, same area. It's called temporal lobe problems. Left side. Now, right lower. Right lawyer, right eye, left eye. It's right, right eye, lawyer, left eye, lawyer. Right side of lawyer, inferior hemonymous hemianopia, hemonymous hemianopia. It's the left parietal oblations. See now, hemianopia is there. Macular sparing is what occipital oblations. Everyone knows that. So, right side hemonymous, hemonymous, same area, not seen by the both eyes. Macular is getting spared. It is because of left side, in this case, left side occipital oblations. Now, we have found out. You have done the field charting also. If you have not found out anything, again, some more signs may help us. Symptoms and signs. You know what is palinopsia? Suppose I see one object is there. I am seeing that object has gone to my brain and got fixed in my occipital lobe. By chance, the object has been removed from the area. Removed from the area. Still, I feel the object is there. It's called palinopsia. That is called perseverance or persistence of images. Even though the object has been removed, it's an occipital oblations. Redox. What is redox phenomena? A moving object I can perceive. A stationary bright light also I am not able to. A moving object I can see, where a stationary object cannot see. Again, when I examine a person like this, if I find this, that means he's having occipital oblations. Like that, you know, you have got um, so many things, other things like extinguished phenomena. All these things you are supposed to do. You have to learn. These are all the various tests for higher uh, parietal operations and all. One more thing, suppose I want to um, move movements. I fix one object, ask him to move. I put a pin, pen in front of the patient. I move the pin, ask him to follow. If the patient is followed classically, he can, he's able to pursue. Pursuit movement is there. I know he uh, doesn't have any problem. When he he's not able to pursue, not able to do that pursuit movement, not able to pursue a 
object, perceive as an object, is having a problem parietal lobe, definitely. So, parietal ablation is there, pursued moment may be a problem for the patient. Now, in spite of that, all these things we have found out, if no cause is found, maybe a case of functional malingere like this. But with talent chart itself, I don't want some of you may not be knowing. So, malingere test, you can find out talent chart itself. Why you know? See now, suppose you know there are so many lines. Suppose I'm having a six to eighteen lines. They're called four letters. There are four letters. Next is what six twelve letter is having five letters are there. Five letters. Why A B C D the five letters? Now the fellow tells you, sir, I am seeing only six eight in only. In the six twelve let line, I am not able to see anything. I really follow. He wants to get some something. He wants to gain something from the because of his visual loss. He wants to gain some compensations and all. He is telling now, sir, I am reading only six. The fellow is reading only six eighteen. Okay, that is fourth line, but. A stellar chart is constructed in such a way, never forget this point. Stellar chart is constructed in such a way when a person reads 6 by 18, you should be able to read at least one or two letters in 6 12 letter also. The stellar chart is constructed in such a way a patient is reading one line. He is supposed to read the next line also one or two letters, not all the letters. Okay, suppose the fellow tells you. Sir, I am reading only 6 to 18. That is the fourth letter, fourth line only. Fifth line, I am not able to see anything. It's a malingerer. It's a malingerer. That means what? Malingering, you can find out style and chart. How? Your answer is, a person is reading some one line. Below that particular line, he, he should be able to read one or two letters. If the fellow tells you he cannot read anything, it's a, it's a case of malingerer. You cannot hear. This is what I told you. He reads 6 by 18, all letters. Now we'll tell he is not in a position to read any letter in 6 12. He's a malingerer. In 6 12 line, you should be able to read at least one or two letters. At least one. Now, if you want to find out, it's called optic in a drum movement. So nobody can resist this movement. The fellow will park, he has to follow the dark stripes and white. That means you cannot control. When you have a, suppose the patient tells you, I'm having usual loss, he's a malingerer. You rotate the drum in front of the patient, you can find out. The patient cannot stop it. Automatically, the eyes will move. Now, finally, you can do what now? If you're not able to find out any reason, do electroretinogram, electrooculogram, visual potentials. All these things can be done to, to find out the unexplained visual loss. Now, I'll tell you, never, never forget, once you're not able to find out any reason in the patient, Think, think, think. Finally, you can come to a conclusion. Definitely. That's why, if not in a position to clinch the reason for the visual loss in the initial examination, never stop. Again, examine. It's not, you're not going to lose anything. So that, no, again and again, examination. But basic importance is what now? History, complaints, proper approach. The most important thing is to find out the unexplained visual loss in the patient. But never forget these are some of the points, you know, the exam of tear fluid instability can produce visual loss. Blepharitis, you have to look for. Pupil, you have to look for. Fields, you have to do the testings. These are all the common things you are supposed to do before arriving at a conclusion. When you examine a person, of, when you are unexplained visual loss to be examined means, Finally, only after doing all these things, only you can do start doing malingering test and all you can find out. I hope you have understood something. Thank you very much. It will be, I think it will be useful when you approach the patient.